welcome to On Point. I'm Teresa Barrientos. CSUN students use multiple platforms to listen to music. Mostly just downloading from iTunes, iTunes. And, and Pandora. I use SoundCloud, Spotify, and Pandora. I usually go with Google Music so I can get access to uh, all albums as soon as they come out. I use Spotify a lot. SoundCloud or Pandora. Back in the year 2000, the first free peer-to-peer file-sharing internet services that emphasized sharing music files came into being. Some of these were LimeWire, FrostWire, and Napster. But a lawsuit was brought against LimeWire in Arista Records versus Lime Group, which held that Lime Group induced copyright infringement with its peer-to-peer file-sharing software, and a permanent injunction was placed. LimeWire was no more. Then, in 2003, Apple introduced the iTunes Music Store. Since 2008, it has been the largest music vendor in the U.S. Although peer-to-peer sharing services are now extinct, new services like Pandora and Spotify allow listeners to hear the music they want for free. We talked to several CSUN students about the cost of music. It stays at $7.99 for me. As for newcomers, or it's around, I believe, close to 10, somewhere around 9. I think premium is like $9.99 or something like that, and I get it for $5.99. While there are many benefits for students who stream their music, it may not always be a good thing for music artists. I think it's better for people, but it's not better for the people whose music we're streaming, being that it's their job for, and we are their commission. So if we don't buy their CDs, they don't get paid. On Point's James Lindsay is here to tell us more about the world of music streaming. Thank you, Teresa. I'm joined with Dash Radio DJ Dean Perez and Cal State Northridge University professor of journalism and musician Scott Brown. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. So my first question today is how do music streaming services affect how listeners interact with music? Uh, well, the thing is we're in a new age now where streaming um, is more accessible. Um, it's easier and you no longer have to depend on, you know, AM, traditional AM or FM where people are providing a playlist for you. Um, as back then, there was no, you know, websites where you could download music, you know, there was no um, place where you could rip a whole CD, so you had no choice but to turn on the radio and kind of just listen to whatever they gave you. However, now everyone's kind of starting to become their own DJ. And there's major streaming services like Pandora, you know, Dash Radio, and there's even small ones. like. You could even create your own little streaming radio and have it your way, you know. So that's where we're at now. Do you have anything to add to that? Scott? I think uh, it's. I think it's kind of introducing a new dimension, a psychological dimension to sort of how we sort of listen to music and attach ourselves to music. I mean, the idea that music can always be available whenever we want it, at any point, it, it, literally get any song we want whenever we want it. It kind of changes the equation. Where it's, it used to be, you have to wait for an actual physical record to come out or a physical CD to come out and that would be your, your only um, opportunity to partake in a, you know, of an artist. Now it's, everything's available all the time and it makes us perhaps a little bit more passive because back, you know, when I was growing up, it was a more active, you had to search it out and when you found it, it became so much more important to you. Whereas now it's, everything's available all the time. I'm not going to say it's better or worse because it's simply, you know, things change. But, uh, it, you know, like I say, it makes our relationship with the songs in our lives really different. Yeah, I was, was going to add on that, too, because he's right. Because we get everything so fast, um, we don't really appreciate that exclusive, like how it used to be. Like, I remember being eight years old. I listened to, like, Power 106 or something, and they have, like, they'll drop a new song. Mm -hmm. And the only time they dropped it was, like, at 4 o'clock. And after the song was over, the only way to hear it was to tune in tomorrow. So you had to wait 24 hours, and you'd like wait, like, oh, it's almost four. They're gonna play it again, and that made you excited. It made you appreciate the song a lot more. Right. Whereas now, everything's on demand. Everything's on demand. So a song is good for like a week or two, and then someone says, oh, that song's old. I'm like, wow, like there's an expiration date. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. that's crazy. You know, songs used to last a lot longer than right. they do now. Well, on the flip side, um, as opposed to listeners, how it affects their yeah. behavior and how they listen to music, how do you think it's affecting artists and how they release and make their music, um, how, do, how they market it to the listener? How do you think it affects it's, them? It's so difficult for artists now, and that's why a lot of artists are touring. Most of their income is coming from touring, whereas back then it's, it was more of sales. Um, it makes it tough, tough on them because there's so many people that do music and like being in radio I've seen so many people come in and go and you know They say check out my music and I check it out and 
to be honest, it doesn't sound any different from the person who is the star, but the star found a way to market themselves through streaming, through YouTube. I mean, there's so many independent artists that are making it nowadays without being attached to a label, which amazes me. Like, you don't need a label anymore. All you need is, you know, good marketing, uh, streaming services that can, you know, such as YouTube, SoundCloud, and you can get discovered. Mm -hmm. you know? Used to be, I mean, I think the equation used to be that artists made their, uh, their money uh, records, live, and merchandising. That was, the, that was the top three sort of revenue streams. Now it's live, third party sponsorship, merchandising, publishing, and uh, and then uh, and then records, you know, which what that the whole streaming thing kind of folds into the whole record royalty thing. So it's literally the last revenue, uh, the uh, the smallest of the revenue streams that artists get these days. Mm -hmm. So it changes everything. So you have to be live, you have to be out there, you have to be pushing your your you know your merchandise, and you have to be sort of trying to hook yourself up with somebody who will put you on a TV show, a video game, or some way that will get your music out. Because to depend on sort of normal channels of distribution, a big record company that will kind of blast your music, that's 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 gone. Mm -hmm. it's no longer exists, or it does exist. I shouldn't say it's gone, but it's so much more reduced than it was than it used to be. Right. I was wondering, could you actually explain a little bit of your history with music? Uh, yeah, I've been playing music since I was like 13 or 14. Uh, just always been in club bands and you know around Los Angeles, occasionally doing tours with stuff. But you know, just, just a work, just not a working musician, but kind of a hobbyist musician. Although, like I've always played, always kept bands going, things like that, and always played around town. So you, you, you sort of see the changes. And we get to my age. I mean, there's really, you know, you, you become sort of like this this, this old dude still playing music. Um, and you and you kind of look at the young people who are trying to get into it, in a, in, you know, in a serious vein. And you go, my God, I mean, good luck to you, because I, I would have no idea how somebody breaks into the music business these days, you know? Definitely. Um, and since, yeah, you've had more of a history you with know. music, how does the shift into digital music and these streaming services, how does that compare to past transitions for instance, records and cassettes onto CDs. Well, I mean, the past, you know, the past sort of changes have always been technological in terms of they really haven't sort of altered the the dynamic between sort of you know the artist and the company. I mean, they were simply just you know, okay, we went from rec went from vinyl to tapes, tapes to CDs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and and in, in essence, it, but the basic equation, the basic relationship between the record art, uh, the record company, and the artist didn't change. With streaming, everything is upended because all of a sudden now you're your own, you're your own distribution channel. You and you know, Steve was saying you don't really don't need the record companies any longer. Mm -hmm. So, and what are um, some of the advantages of, of music streaming services compared to physical formats? Would you say? Oh, look, there's many advantages to streaming services. For instance, um, right now the problem with AM/FM radio is that they have playlists that they stick to, repetitive playlists, and they're not showing the listener what's really out there. There's so much music out there, and to stick to a a playlist that has about 20 songs and you have your power records, your recurrence, and you have your sub powers. Those are basically how they play their songs. So if you heard a song that's always being played, it's more than likely a power record. And what DJs do is they have to look at that list and they have rules where they have to play it each like once or twice every hour. Right. So not only does it affect listeners, it affects DJs. They, they no longer have freedom to play what they want. It's someone from above telling them this is what you're going to play. So it's not the DJ's fault. If you're listening to any radio station, you're like, man, he needs to stop playing this. If he doesn't play it, he gets in trouble. Right. He gets fined. So it's not really his fault. And I think people don't understand that when it, when it comes to the... So going off that, do you think that affects maybe the album listening experience? Um, people have, oh. have these streaming services where it kind of caters to them, tells them what to listen to almost. Do you think they listen to the full album as much or more of these kind of playlists or radio stations that are kind of tailored to to their tastes? Uh, the majority of individuals don't listen to albums anymore. Um, you do have some diehard fans that still love the effect of a, a, an album that tells a story, uh, you know, with the effect and emotion. But, um, I mean, that's why we started where we started, this whole Dash Radio. You know, um, DJ Ski used to be part of 102.7, and he got tired of not being able to express, you know, himself through music. There was a lot of artists he said, look, I want to bring him in, I want to expose him, and they're like, well, how many followers does he have? Is he popular? Well, he's he's kind of popular. Okay, no. He needs to be at this point to expose him. Like, why? See, when you start doing that, it's no longer about music. Mm -hmm. It's about marketing and popularity. Mm -hmm. So he creates an app, Dash Radio. You know, it has over 60 stations, no commercials. Um, it has, you know, 
DJs that play live, you know, Snoop has a station, you know, Mac Miller, Art LeBeau, is, uh, his radio syndicate is on there. And it's a place where it's once again about the music. Mm -hmm. And actually, like, we're not just putting one song off the album, we're putting six songs off the album so people could get that whole experience. Even Apple did it. Look what Apple, what Apple, what Beats did with the with radio. They they stepped into the radio game because they understood that there was a market for it and that people were starting to move away from the traditional, you know, hey, turn on the radio, let me see what's on. Because people are starting to be DJs themselves. They're starting to create their own right. playlists. They're starting to go out and actually experiment. Right. And I feel like AM, FM radio is just lagging behind on that. They they do not understand that the internet is so powerful and yet they continue to play the same thing over and over and over again. And you know, having long commercials, like people tune out, if we, if we can't even appreciate an album for a month, what makes you think people are gonna sit there and listen to a two minute commercial? No, they're gonna, they're gonna change it, yeah. So what do, you, what do you think, Scott? Do you think it's a, a positive, ne negative sort of um, influence on radio? Well, I think that there's um, something that, that, that affects radio and streaming services, and that's sort of like the narrowing of vision. As you are absolutely right. I mean, the, the sort of like the restrictions on playlists are incredible, right? You get, sort of get this very, very you know, sort of like narrow channel of like you know songs that are played. But also, I think one of the dangers of, of streaming is that you get the ba recommendations based on what you like. Well, I'm not always wanting recommendations based on what I like. I mean, I like stuff that's, that's out of left field. Sometimes streaming services with all their algorithms and things like that, they simply kind of generate a genre that I'm listening to and I realize I'm kind of stuck in this, this wind tunnel where I'm hearing bands that are kind of like what I do, but I'm really not breaking out in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one thing that I think streaming and radio has in common. I, I think streaming is much better, obviously, than radio because it's not necessarily tied strongly as, uh, to economics as radio is. But you know, I still would like the uh, the ability for somebody somewhere to say, this is not anything you've ever heard, and this is not based on recommendations of what you would like. But I think that you you might find this interesting, mm -hmm. you know, and surprise me. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that's what uh, for Dash Radio where I'm at. That's what we allow the DJ to do. So it's not just like Pandora or Spotify. There's no algorithms. There's live DJs. There's people playing. There's no restrictions. So you probably get to hear something you may not hear. And that's traditional radio being brought back. Right. That, like it's, yeah. it's personally recommended mm -hmm. from Snoop exactly. Dogg. Yeah. It's personally exactly. recommended yeah. from, that, from one of your DJs yeah. that rather than an algorithm. Right. Exactly. That element of surprise. And there's times where even I'm listening to it and I'm like, oh, who's this? Right. And, I, and I work there. Yeah. And I have to go, who's playing? Mm -hmm. Who is it? What, what did he just play? Yeah. And it brings back that feeling we were talking about, about like having to wait or like not knowing when you're going to hear it again and like, oh man, like I need to go find this song. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, discovering music um, for streaming services, do you think maybe with the amount of music that is put up on all these programs and services, do you think it maybe helps younger audiences get into some older music that they might not have ever been into before? Yeah, I would agree because I know uh, 92.3, which is now um, 92, uh, which is real. I guess they play hip hop now. I used to love listening to that station because they played a lot of old school. They took it away. Mm -hmm. But with these streaming services, they can put that back on and people could go and listen to older music. I, re I really don't believe in taking out older music and like putting new, new, new. When you make everything new, 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 you're just going to get the same thing. Which, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I have a daughter who's 23 three right now, and I was surprised when she got her first iPod, remember iPods? Uh, when she got her first iPod and started filling it with music, and she started filling it with stuff, you know, you know from, from my years, right, um, as well as current stuff. Um, and I was, you know, very surprised, by it. And, and she still kind of listens, you know, across generations, you know, not just, um, you know, of, of her time. So I think it, it adds definitely to a broader experience, the ability to access, you know, not just what's out there, but anything that you want, anytime. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, again, there's always the flip of like uh, attachment, right? I mean, you know, my, the story I always tell her is that you can listen to the Velvet Underground, great, you got it, but I found that record in a used <laughs> record store after months of searching because it was out of print, and I still have that, and I value that record so much, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, but now, of course, you can get anything. Right? Definitely. Yeah. So, um, at the end of the day, where do you see AM, FM radio kind of going? Do you think it will continue? Do you think it might become obsolete in the near future and it might just go straight to just these streaming services? That, that's a tough question. Depends on technology because I know for sure that there's already cars that are coming with Wi-Fi and once you have that Wi-Fi you don't need it you don't need to tune to AM FM. It's just there. You can just log on your best friend's radio show through internet 
or you could, you know, hop on, listen to beats, listen to dash right through your car. And that's starting to happen. People already do it with the auxiliary cord. The auxiliary cord has become like a driver's best friend. You know, when you don't want to hear what the radio is giving you, just plug in, make your own playlist. And like, that's how it all started for me. You know, I, I caught myself using the auxiliary cord over the last, you know, five years because in my opinion, I just felt like radio was getting worse and worse. And there's so many great artists out there that are popular, but radio stations are not going to mess around with them because I guess they don't meet a certain standard. But what standard are they talking about? There is no more standard. The only standard is if they're popular and they're good, you should give the people what they want and you should play it. Because mm -hmm. they're going to get it one way or another. If you're not going to play it for them, then they're going to shut you off and they're going to plug in their phone. So, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you agree? Do you? I, I still listen to a lot of radio, but I listen to a lot of college radio because it's unfiltered. Um, the, the problem with, but the flip side of that is that the curators aren't always so great. You know, so I'm, I love the fact that it's not necessarily corporate controlled, so there's an openness. But on the other hand, the person necessarily playing the music, eh, I don't necessarily always, you know, trust or like, you know, what that person's playing. So, you know, it's a flip side. But, you know, I, again, I always gravitate to more open channels mm -hmm. of, uh, of media. So would you say some form of radio will always kind of... Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, radio will always be here. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, whether there's, it's Wi-Fi or... Yeah, you know, there's, there's a certain feeling you get from radio because you could put a playlist on, but just the action, the timing, the emotion you feel when someone is energetic delivering something for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying the person has to talk for, you know, five minutes, but just that person that's giving you that experience, that live experience, it affects you. You know, because if you've ever been to a party where someone's playing just a playlist off a phone, it's completely different than having a person who's actually DJing. <laughs> it's just, even if you don't see what he's doing, you can hear it. You know, the ear, the ear's powerful. And I don't think radio's gonna, gonna not go anywhere. I just feel that AM, FM, they're gonna have to make some adjustments right. if they want to keep, if they want to stay in the game. Because there's a crazy battle going on right now with streaming services. It's all over the place. You have like five different options of just picking and choosing, and it's just about which one suits you best, I guess, to your style. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to um, how the artists kind of play into all this, uh, you kind of touched on a little bit earlier as to how they how they make their, their right. money these or days. Or not make their money. Not make their money, <laughs> yeah. but how do they kind of counteract their, their lack of royalties or when people do sign up for free services such as Spotify, they do the free version or the Pandora yeah. version. How do they kind of counteract losing, or not losing, but gaining so little? Well, that, that's the question. I mean, I, I remember there was an article in the New York Times a couple of years ago about a woman who um, plays what they call avant cello, right? And she had like a, a million and a half plays. And her royalties for a million and a half plays was like $1,600, which is crazy. I mean, you know, if you were thinking that I'd, I, I was an artist and I'd sold a million and a half copies, I wouldn't be getting $1,600. Well, that's, and that's considered make, you know, doing well. I mean, so. Uh, you know, I I think that the old equation, the old the old economics is uh, we're not going to we're not going to go back there. You know, and everyone kind of say, well, what what can mon what how can we monetize this? How can we save the record industry? Well, it just might be that that period of the record industry, from like after World War II to you know around 2000, that was an exceptional period, and we're going we're we've entered in a new period where we're not going to see that, that those big dollar days any longer, and we have to get used to that. So. Royalties just may be a smaller part of an overall pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people have no idea how there's so many artists out there, like even some of their favorite artists, and they're not as rich as you think. Like, um, you know, the other day I, I had interviewed an artist named Denzel Curry, who's like blowing up in hip hop. His videos have over one million. You know, one of them has five million views, and he's not where everyone thinks he is. You know, because like you said, the royalties, he doesn't really get a dime from it. But I'll tell you one thing, he's hopping from show to show. He's right. traveling because that's the biggest amount of income they can get from anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's, he's, he was in L.A., now he's in Europe. And a lot of artists are actually starting to venture overseas, whereas back then, they would make enough money to just tour in the U.S. You know, if they went out of the U.S., it was out of their own, like, comfort. Like, okay, yeah, I'll go tour. Now it's like, I have to. Because money, like I need, I should, I need to go to Europe. You know, I need to go to Australia. I need to make this money that I'm not getting from the sales or right. or from people who are downloading my music. So streaming does affect the artist, and and I still really feel that people, if if an artist puts in an important body of work, I still feel that people should preview it and buy it. You know, if you could spend ten dollars on a burrito, why not spend ten dollars for an artist who has spent night and day 
making that album. Making albums and music is not easy. It's very, very difficult. You know, there's, there's no clock in time. There's no, um, you know, it's just, it's whenever it's done. You may have to think about it differently. Instead of, I'm buying music, I'm supporting the artist. And once you do that, I think it's easier to sort of you know, pony up for the money. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, but, but again, I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, one of the things musicians always say is, thank God for t-shirt sales, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be getting anything, you know? Well, you were saying, yeah, um, what was his name? Sorry, that was... Uh, Denzel Curry. So he has, to, he has to go out and really yeah, show himself you, around. Do you, do you feel like with that um, sort of thing being so important, do you feel like maybe image has kind of taken over as kind of almost a priority? Not over music, but as a bigger part of being a musician is having a certain image oh, yeah. to promote. You have to. It's no longer about whether you're good or not. Like this guy is amazed. He's talented. I mean, he's like, he's definitely gonna go far. Like, he's definitely up there with like artists such as like maybe like a Nas or you know or a J Cole. But it's the image because he's probably doing the same thing another artist is doing, but he's doing it in a particular style where those million people are catering towards him and not the other person. Uh, back then, it was true. If you were really good at what you did, it didn't really matter how you looked, you know, and what your attitude was like. It was all about the music. With all this Instagram and streaming services and Snap and all that, you have to look a certain way. And it's not just the music they have to like. They have to like you. If it doesn't go with the music, then nothing's, nothing's going to go good for you, which I, it's sad. You know, that's why a lot of the times in my power as a DJ working with these streaming services, I try to bring that essence back of bringing in an artist regardless of what they have. If their music is good, I'm going to support it. I'm going to push for it. Right. You know, because that's what DJs did back then. Now you have DJs who are doing payola. Who, Can you play my song? Oh, yeah, give me, here's, here are my rates. Here's a thousand. Right. You give me a thousand, I'll play it on the radio. Yeah. Regardless of the song, if the song's good, I, why am I going to charge you a thousand dollars? It's going to make me look good. I'm the one who broke it. I'm the one who showed everyone this song. Right. So, well, um, apart from radio and the streaming services and everything, there are there is a physical format of music that is kind of making a little bit of a comeback, which is vinyl records. Why do you think that is? That vinyl records are making somewhat of a, a little bit of a comeback right now, or their the sales are kind of rising. Well, I think there's. So much of stream music is intangible. When you buy a physical object, there's a tangibility, and not to get sort of get you know too metaphysical, but a famous cultural critic talked about aura of art, and that every piece of art has an aura to it. Um, now, when you actually buy something, you actually feel connected to it in a way. So I think that's one thing. I think that we there's such a lack of connection with so much media being thrown at us these days that to actually hold something is actually pretty important, um, and also just sonic quality. I mean, we you know. We were talking earlier just about how music is produced, you know, for MP3s, for earbuds, and it's compressed like hell and it sounds terrible, but you put on an old, you know, a vinyl record and the sonic spectrum is huge. Um, and you can actually enjoy it in a way and you hear things and you can hear it in a way that it's really difficult to hear, you know, in your tiny little earbuds, right? And so and I think too, just as humans, we're really like we're curious individuals. There's um I interviewed a 19-year-old who's who's also is like getting really popular, and he did his whole album um, through analog. Mm -hmm. And the and the first thing that I tell myself is, what is this 19-year-old kid yeah. doing, trying to make his album analog? And I knew he did it because when I first reviewed the album and I listened to it, I go, dude, this sounds sonically correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for him to say that, being 19, I asked him why did he do that, and he said, well. I went on the internet and I saw like how they did it back then and he goes because I noticed that albums back then sounded so clean and the new ones today sounded kind of distorted so vinyl and all that and making albums you know sonically correct again it's, it's coming back because people are starting to actually do their research and that's what these streaming services do they allow us to see to, to venture out into things that are not given to us on the daily. Right. Because we're only going to be given a certain amount of, you know, of the same thing on a platform every day. And it's going to be the same thing, whether it's music, whether it's commercials, whether it's cars, whether it's buying the new iPhone. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to show you the other stuff that you can, that can benefit you. You have to go find it. So I think more people are starting to do that. And when they listen to a vinyl, they go, oh, my God, this does sound good. Mm -hmm. you know, it does sound different or like he said the connection holding on to something when you pay for something you 
I mean, you value it more. It's 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 something that you're gonna listen to it over and over again. You know, we're in we're in a society that because everything is free, we just take it for granted. Like, oh, it was free anyway. Let's just you know, I'll kind of put put it aside, mm -hmm. and that's not how we should act. I mean, yeah. But mo moving on from streaming services, digital music, and everything, right now, if you guys were to predict what kind of device or what kind of um, method we'd be listening to music in maybe like 50 years or so, do you have any sort of uh, prediction as to how we might be listening to music? The Wi-Fi in cars, that that's probably a big one. But any other any other predictions that you might? Wow, I can't speak for technology. I, I will say that the only thing I hope doesn't this this current trend doesn't have continue on which is music is being seen as a lost leader for merchandising you know it's almost like here's my music free but buy my gear right or whatever and I, I think that's I don't I think that's very harmful because ultimately the music is the product right the gear is is not, is the accessory right um, so I, I hope that that trend would be reversed when we kind of get to the back to the point of things which is the, the sounds I make as opposed to sort of like the accessories that Enable you to buy it. I mean. Yeah, he makes a good point on that because even with Drake, um, as popular as he is, people think that he's popular because of memes and the media, the attention he gets on like social media. But in reality, it's the music. Mm -hmm. People connect to his music, and it's always going to be about the music because if he wasn't good, there wouldn't be no memes. You wouldn't see him everywhere on your phone or on a on a you know on radio. You so. Um, to get away from that idea, I think the clothes and all that, that that's been happening. But I understand why they need to they need to find some way to make money, but I'd rather have the artists just push it through Definitely. their music yeah. instead okay. of merchandising. Well yeah guys, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. You love their music. Why would you steal it? When you illegally download your favorite band's music, they might just disappear. Downloading music without paying for it is just not cool. Come on, let's go. Just a minute, I gotta finish this. Wait, you're gonna post those pictures of Mary? Yep, do you think she's so hot? But her mom and dad will see them. Her grandmother, her little sister, everyone she knows, it's gonna kill her. Who cares? Just a couple of pictures. It's no big deal. No big deal? Don't. This has gotta stop. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at CSUN On Point. You can watch us on LA 36 on Sunday mornings at 1130 and listen to us on KCSN 88.5 FM at 530 also on Sunday mornings. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Teresa Barrientos and we'll see you next week.